Happy Earth Day. It's 50th anniversary um, of Earth Day, and we're happy you could join us for this virtual celebration. So thank you for being here. Um, I'm Todd Samsel with the Friends of Virgin Islands National Park. And in a minute, I'll introduce our speaker for this session. Um, first, I wanted to just recognize and thank uh, our sponsors and partners for Earth Day. Uh, they were all, along with us, really looking forward to getting together in person, but um, we're appreciative that they're uh, supporting us and helping us to bring Earth Day to you virtually. Um, our Earth Day sponsors are Island Green Living Association, which we will actually hear from later um, today. Uh, Virgin Islands Waste Management Authority, uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands uh, Department of Tourism, and our Virgin Islands National Park. Uh, here in the Virgin Islands on St. John in particular, we're blessed to have Virgin Islands National Park, and we're all working hard with our National Park staff uh, to make sure the park is ready to welcome you back if you're not here um, when you get a chance to visit. Um, so we look forward to that. Just, just a bit of housekeeping, um, if everyone could stay muted, um, please feel free to type in any questions. Uh, we're, we're watching in the chat for that, but we will have time at the end for some Q&A as well. So if you wanna wait uh, till the end, that's fine as well. Just a quick disclaimer, we are recording these so that we can use them later with classrooms and on our website. Um, so if you don't want to be on a recorded uh, presentation, feel free to turn your uh, camera, video camera off. Otherwise, we're taking it as we have your permission to show your, your bright and smiling face um, in the future. So thank you. Um, so this session on our virtual Earth Day lineup is what does reef safe mean? And we're really thrilled um, to have uh, Mike Maltier from uh, Executive Vice President of Stream to Sea uh, to help us answer that question. Uh, we're really uh, appreciative of the work that Stream to Sea has done. They were down here uh, in the Virgin Islands working with our VI government uh, uh, on legislation um, to make sure that we had uh, appropriate um, regulations in place to help protect our coral reefs and our marine resources. And so um, I'm going to turn the screen sharing over to Mike. Uh, without further ado, Mike, thanks for being with us. My pleasure. And it looks like I'm going to see if I can figure out how to share my screen. Always entertaining with people watching. No pressure. There we go. Excellent. It looks like it is almost lined up. Are you seeing my screen now? Did I get some nods? Yes. I got it. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, everybody was following directions and muted themselves. How wonderful. That's so rare on these calls. I usually get lots of them. So I have uh, a plethora of slides. And it is something that there's no way that we're gonna be able to do in 30 minutes because there's so much science involved with all of this. But what I'm going to do is kind of fly through some of them that, that don't matter as much. And if we need to go back in questions and answer session, uh, that is terrific. And I'm happy to share any of these with anybody later on if they want to go in further depth, we can schedule that as well. So, it was originally stated that Autumn was going to be here. Autumn was down in the Virgin Islands helping with um, passing the legislation. Our um, cosmetic chemist and scuba diver, an amazing uh, you know, entrepreneur, has figured out a way to make hand sanitizer. So unfortunately, our factory is not set up to make hand sanitizer, so we're having to do most of it by hand. It's amazing how quickly if you use the machines, things will explode when you're dealing with alcohol. So <laughs> we are pivoting, doing the old entrepreneurial spirit and um, seeing if we can help out some of the first responders and things like that as well. Unfortunately, we're having trouble shipping it else uh, we would have it there as well. It's, uh, it's difficult to ship unless it's UPS ground. Um, that is me. I am not as much a diver as Autumn, but have been. Um, and I was raised in Hawaii. I think the only, I've done almost every water sport and the only ones that I'm competitive in are uh, Hobie cat racing um, and probably whitewater guiding, maybe outrigger canoe racing. So I'm very jealous of your tropics. I enjoyed my time there, by the way. It was amazing to see 
everything that I hadn't seen from my childhood, if we were on the correct side of the island for it. So part of what we need to look at in, when we look at what is reef safe is what the actual problems with the other things are. And it's because there are non-reef safe things in a lot of products that we use every day, not just the sunscreen. But we're gonna kind of jump into that. So there's a picture five months apart, unfortunately. So here's the deal. If you use sunscreen, people are saying, well, I don't go in the water or 80% of shampoo, conditioner, lotion, things that you put on your system actually have all of these chemicals in them as well. So 30 minutes after application of a chemical sunscreen, they can actually detect elevated levels of estrogen and endocrine disruptors and all of the sunscreen chemicals in your urine. So literally, you wash it off in the shower and it gets out into the ocean eventually. Even if you're on septic systems, it eventually gets into the water. So very, very important to us. A lot of people say that it doesn't, you know, we, we don't use that much. So dilution is the solution. Well, 14,000 tons of sunscreen inner reefs just by people walking into the water. That doesn't include those showers. That doesn't include going through wastewater treatment plants. It doesn't include anything that's coming through streams. So that's actually a NOAA estimation that 14,000 tons of sunscreen enters the U.S. reef. Oxybenzone, octanoxate, you guys also banned uh, octocrylene, which is beautiful. Uh, parabens, clear, and non nano zinc are highly toxic to corals and marine life. All of that testing was really well documented. It's real easy to look that up. As a matter of fact, if you look at clear, nano zinc, even zinc, if you go to the MSDS sheets, it says right on there toxic to the aquatic environment. And yet, it's still okay for us to use. It only takes one drop of oxybenzone in actually six and a half Olympic size swimming pools to kill coral larva. That's 62 parts per trillion. Later on, we're going to get to slides that show you. See, this is, you have to remember this. We're going to test you on this. It'll show you the actual parts per trillion in Trunk Bay. I have it for Panama Bay. I have it for all over Maui and, you know, the Hawaiian Islands and things like that. 62 parts per trillion is where it starts to become toxic for coral larvae. All of these chemicals um, are known to bioaccumulate and they are known endocrine disruptors. So many people don't know what the endocrine system is. I saw on our sign up that we had two children, so I'm not going to go into too much depth on the reproductive system. I don't know their age. So we're going to censor uh, just wisely. But if you look at things on this, on the endocrine disruptors, um, perfumes, if you look on your shampoo or conditioner or lotion, if it says fragrance, there are 1,372 chemicals that are allowed by the FDA under the term fragrance. 52 of them are estrogen mimickers. And there's another around 50 that are endocrine disruptors. So they're hidden under the term fragrance. The beauty of a sunscreen is because it is considered an over-the-counter drug, by law, you have to put all of the ingredients on there if it's in the fragrance. It, we don't have any drugs in ours, but that's how it is set up by the FDA. So oxybenzone applied to skin is absorbed and transferred into breast milk. It's been shown to you know, increase endometriosis and actually Hirschsprung's disease. Hirschsprung's disease, if people are unfamiliar, it's when a child is born without a colon. So within a couple days of birth, they actually need to have surgery to make sure that they can eliminate waste or they pass away. Does a little bit of estrogen in the water matter? Well, this shows that if you add estrogen, you get more female fish. If you add androgen, you get more male fish. Right, so yeah, it does matter. Hey Mike, can you uh, maybe just elevate your voice a little bit? I'm not sure if you're a little bit Certainly. low on my end or closer to the mic. Okay, I have headphones in. I'm hoping that that's gonna help. No, it's not helping at all. No, now you're off. <laughs> wow, okay, well, let's try it with just the computer. That's better, that's better. No. Okay, excellent. Well, maybe I'm having a headphone issue. I love the technical difficulties when you get into these things. Um, so oxybenzone effects on, on reef and know that octocrylene, octanoxate, all of these different things have similar but slightly different impacts on the reefs. 
it uh, you know obviously transforms healthy coral larvae into, into deformed inert larva, feminizes male fish, leads to increased coral bleaching, DNA damage. The skeleton system of coral is the endocrine system. So this is where you run into problems if you add endocrine disruptors. It's obviously bad for humans, but the skeletal system of a nice healthy piece of coral is its endocrine system. Interestingly enough, oxybenzone was the 2014 allergen of the year. I, nobody knew that. So that's why they created octanoxate. That's why they created avobenzone, all these different things. Um, it doesn't seem to matter the benzophenones, whether it's an oxybenzone or an avobenzone, as far as human impact. So there was a study out of Sweden that showed if you had any of the benzophenones in your system and you went to conceive a child, that child will come out 30% more likely to get Parkinson's throughout their life, 30% more likely to have Alzheimer's. They will have an endocrine system that is compromised from birth. Their estrogen receptors will not be as effective from birth. It's hard to conceive of a male child because you'll have enough estrogen in there to throw off the reproductive system. And if you do conceive of that male child, once again, censoring myself here, the um, reproductive organs on that male child will not be of a standard size. Let that sink in. You can use the, the term micro later on. Um, it is toxic to sperm and sperm development. It's a testosterone blocker, like I said, detected in your urine 30 minutes after application to your skin. 96.8% of Americans tested had oxybenzone in their bodies. So we wonder why our fertility has gone down close to 60% in the last 25 years. Right? It's supposed to go down another 20% in the next 10 years based on the fact that we're continuing to use so many of these chemicals and that production of plastic has gone through the roof and we're using it in everything. That's one of the deals with our new hand sanitizer is most hand sanitizers have triclosan and carboners in it, which uh, carboners are microplastics. Triclosan is very toxic to a lot of things. So let's get right into your backyard. Remember, we said 62 parts per trillion is killing coral larva. Now, these were tests in 2017 in Trunk Bay. We said parts per trillion. All of these numbers are parts per billion. There's too many people getting into the water with toxic sunscreens, not enough movement of that water to push it out. When I was there, I knew that that was the case and unfortunately was unwilling to go swimming in Trunk Bay because as a 51-year-old male trying to keep all of my parts operational, I'm not getting into a water full of estrogen. I went, what was it called? Lemon Bay? That maybe three bays around the corner, something like that. And there were fish. There were not a lot of coral. Um, about four days later, we went on the other side of the island. You know, it was amazing how much more life there was when you had to take a four-wheel drive Jeep and, you know, go through a bunch of puddles to get to a bay where there weren't many tourists. Pretty impressive, the difference. It reminded me of my childhood in Hawaii, which unfortunately, um, Hanama Bay, where I grew up, is sitting at 29,800 parts per trillion, and all of the coral in that bay is dead. It's now taken this uh, in interesting pandemic to make the fish even come back out of their holes. When I took my kids back 10 years ago, they said, Dad, this is a beautiful bay, but why did we bring our mask and snorkel? When I was a child, you could not walk up to your knees without being hit multiple times by fish over 10 pounds. And you couldn't find them when we went back. You had to go looking in the cracks and crevices. So this current slide, it doesn't seem to matter whether I say octanoxate for 96 hours at 100 parts per billion or oxybenzone at you know, 200 parts per trillion, whatever. The end result seems to be this. The ones at the top are nice, healthy coral with the algae. The ones down at the bottom are bleached. The one in the middle is actually a brain coral that a, a coral researcher, one of the volunteers that went out said, 
oh no, I need something that's hypoallergenic. I'm going to use my own sunscreen instead of using ours. Hers had oxybenzone, octanoxate, all sorts of different chemicals in it. And it was what the divers call a sporty day, meaning a little bit choppy. And she was going to bump into this brain coral. So she lightly touched her hand down onto it. And a week later, there's her handprint bleached into the brain coral. So it took one two second touch of what was on a human body in the water and it bleached that coral. Now at the end of a year, it was still there and the edges of the coral were all, all starting to die off. So they believe that that one, one two second touch of those chemicals caused that problem. So like I said, here's 100 parts per billion of the top aerosol sunscreen brand. Right, 96 hours, they all tend to look like that. And we have hundreds of those slides if anybody needs that sort of information. This is what happens when you expose little fish, these dotty back orchids, when you uh, expose them, organs have exploded. The larva on the right has had an aneurysm. When we go further into it, this is what happens when you spray an aerosol sunscreen. Those, that's not my terms. This gal, Melina Fagan, that made a, a video called it the sunscreen footprints of death. It sounds like it should be uh, some Star Wars thing. You know, bum, bum, bum. But aerosol is actually a herbicide. So when you spray on grass, this is what it looks like the next day when you come back. Killed the grass around your feet. I have, I'm actually here in Boise, Idaho. And I know a lot of the whitewater rafting companies, and one of them caught me in the airport about mm, probably nine months ago and said, hey, a customer was spraying this aerosol sunscreen and it killed my favorite plant on the deck. Do you think there's a correlation? <laughs> I'm like, well, you're asking the question, the question, what do you think? Yeah, there's definitely a correlation. This is an herbicide. So the problem with it is we talked about how sunscreen goes through your skin. When you spray one spray of aerosol, 450 square meters away, they can detect it in the sand, right? So you look at that and say, our lungs are beautifully adapted to take oxygen and push it right into your bloodstream. When you taste somebody else's aerosol sunscreen that they've sprayed, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, you can smell it, you can taste it, <laughs> and Diane's going, ooh, yeah, I get it. It's awful, yeah. That means that it's gone into your bloodstream very quickly as well, right? So within moments, the person that is spraying around you has actually changed your estrogen levels. And know that that's not a good thing. When we, my wife says, oh, it would be nice to add a little bit more estrogen. No, no, synthetic estrogen is actually what ends up causing things like estrogen positive cancer don't want that. I actually had a young gal tell me that it would enhance what she uh, naturally didn't have. And I said, nope, that's not how that works. Sorry. Good thought. This is tests from a marine bird preserve that is close to a half a mile away from where any humans normally frequent. All of their bird eggs have sunscreen chemicals in them. So it's coming from the aerosol that is moving from the beach that is closest to them. And here are the UV chemicals in the muscles of the fish. And they've done things like figure out, you know, salmon versus tuna versus all sorts of different things. That gets into a lot of depth. But it shows in here we've got all of those things that we were worried about and actually a number of them that have been banned for years. So they're bioaccumulating, you know, like PABAs and things like that, that we haven't seen for quite a long time. Although there is one company that I ran into in the U.S. Virgin Islands that is selling a PABA sunscreen still. And it's considered a type two category um, toxic chemical. And I have no idea why it was allowed, but they're doing it. So we do have these cards and I'm pretty sure at the, um, Friends of Virgin Islands, we've got these cards in the store, one of the places that you can buy our products. You are welcome to go and pick these up. We will send them as many as they need. It's all just the things to look for in the products that you have. Now understand, 
if it's a body care product and not a sunscreen, you're not going to be able to find them, you know, these chemicals in there. And that's because they hide them under that term fragrance. But happy to share as many of those as anybody needs. So why use chemical or mineral? What's the difference? According to the FDA, they have said that what makes the most sense at this point, they're not going so far as to say, don't use the other things, but what they've said is go mineral. Mineral is probably the only safe way to go. That was put out, oh, probably two months ago by the FDA. Um, interestingly enough, this current stimulus package that just went out, Mitch McConnell was nice enough to add some pork in there. He put for his constituents in Kentucky, that they are allowed to use innovative sunscreen chemicals without getting any FDA approval. Yeah, I don't know why that sort of thing gets passed. That doesn't make any sense to me, and there's no connection to what the stimulus package was, but everybody wanted to pass that stimulus package as fast as possible, so that just went out. We have no idea what that's going to do. There are all sorts of chemicals that they use in the UK that everybody thinks, oh, the UK is so much ahead of the United States. Actually, when it comes to body care products, they're behind. And that's really interesting to me because in a lot of things like food and you know prescriptions and things like that, they might be considered ahead. But at this point in the UK and the EU, you are allowed to use trade names. So if you look at some of them, my favorite one you can Google is Helioplex. In the United States, it'll say Helioplex, and then it'll say all of the nasty toxic chemicals right behind it. In the EU, it just says Helioplex, which if you like the sound of that word, that sounds amazing. Helioplex, it blocks everything. You're going to be so safe. You have no idea what you're putting in your body. So titanium dioxide and zinc oxide are what they're saying are the safest. I will give a little caveat there. I would read the MSDS sheet on zinc. A lot of people don't like me saying that because it's so much better than the chemicals. Honestly, so much better than the chemicals. But zinc oxide, as it starts to break down, changes the pH. So if it changes the pH around something that's trying to breed, it will cause a problem. So titanium to me is the safest and will show how it settles and how that's important. A mineral sunscreen works outside of the body. It reflects the UV rays back. There's actually drugs in most of the chemical sunscreens that pulls the chemicals into your system and it doesn't reflect it back. It actually absorbs the sun's rays. So to me, it is a leap. There's no science on this, but there is science to say that A, your estrogen levels go up, B, your endocrine system is compromised. Now you're pulling all of the sun's rays underneath your skin. I know how energy works, and if you listen to the manufacturers, they say that that energy just disperses. To me, it sounds like it's probably creating free radicals, which just makes you much more likely to catch every other kind of disease out there. So according to some studies, uh, you're four times more likely to get skin cancer since the inception of chemical sunscreens than you are before. Who knows, right? That could be because the ozone layers, I mean, there's all sorts of stuff, who knows? I'm always curious who funds these, these studies. So it's much more stable. What's beautiful about a chemical sunscreen, um, not a chemical sunscreen, chemical sunscreens last about a year, and then they get more toxic and they get less effective uh, very quickly. With a mineral sunscreen, it goes on immediately. It lasts for about three years on the shelf. After three years, it starts to separate. So it doesn't necessarily get toxic. There is the potential that the preservatives can keep up. But three years, you should be able to go through a tube in three years. Or you're not a sunscreen user. The ones that say clear or go on clear, or if they do go on very nicely like a lotion rather than like a sunscreen, a mineral sunscreen, it's very harmful to the aquatic environment because those have nanoparticles. Nanoparticles actually get directly into fish eggs and cause serious problems. In British Columbia, there's a river called the Cowchin River, comes off Cowchin Lake. They determined that over the last four years, there was not a single salmon that hatched. They all went and laid their eggs, but none of them hatched. 
Interestingly enough, the studies showed that they had all of these sunscreen chemicals in the eggs. Somebody has now paid off that group. So if you go to Tube Shack, um, they all use stream to sea sunscreen. They will not rent tubes to anybody that's using anything other than stream to sea sunscreen, but they have taken down the study that shows that it was all sunscreen chemicals in eggs. So they said, originally, we're doing this because of the eggs. And then they said, there's no proof that it causes any problems with eggs. So somebody obviously sued somebody. This is really important when you look at a mineral sunscreen versus a chemical because chemicals have tried to convince us that we need an SPF 50 or an SPF 100. That's because it's very difficult to get to an SPF 50 with a mineral sunscreen. Based on this chart, is it all that important? The difference between an SPF 30 and an SPF 100 is less than 2%. These are all rounded off. So what difference does it make? Right? Less than 2%, we're talking about time, we're not talking about total protection. So it's, it's negligible. If you're really worried about it, um, ours is rated for 80 minutes in and out of the water, so put it on every 80 minutes. Personally, when I was there, I applied at 10 o'clock in the morning. I was in three different bays for about an hour to two hours each, and I only reapplied to the places that were hot spots because I can feel them. My wife can't, so we put it on every couple hours for her. So this is one of these studies that you can actually look up on our YouTube channel, just stream to see um, when you get to YouTube. This was a test that somebody did and you can watch the video and it's, it's a little bit of a nightmare, kind of horrendous. We put stream to see in one aquarium. We didn't, somebody else did, but they put stream to see in one aquarium. They had a control group and then they had one, hard to read, but it's got octanoxate, octosalicate, it's got oxybenzone in it. Um, you put that in there, within 96 hours, nothing died in the stream to sea group. The control group one fish died. In the competitor sunscreen, three died within 96 hours. 30% attrition is just fine for the EPA. They don't think that that is aquatic toxicity. So if 30% of the fish die, eh, that's kind of normal. Well, the control group doesn't show that, and our group was actually healthier than the control group, probably because we have some. Oxidants. The problem with it is, when we go to the next slide, this is the swimming behavior. So in the stream to sea group, yeah, one fish at the six hour mark took a break for a little bit. Um, at the 96 hour mark, it took a little break. But if you look at the other one, within six hours, almost everything stopped swimming. At 24 hours and 48 hours, there was no movement. Okay, the fish were still alive, except for those poor three that died. The other seven, they weren't moving at all. At 72 hours, they started moving again. And so the testing says that is movement. They're fine. They're actually recovering from it. Turns out it was actually neurological damage. And so the fish were going into rigor mortis. They were swimming upside down. They were swimming into the side of the tank. They were swimming at odd angles. They were not healthy fish. Unfortunately, at the two week mark, everything passed away. So it turns out within 15 minutes of exposure to these chemicals at these levels, they stop eating and they'll never start eating again. So fishermen have known this for years. If you have a live bait well and you put your hand with sunscreen on it into that bait well, two thirds of the motility stops within 15 minutes, right? So amazingly toxic. And this is actually exposure to shampoo, right? So you look at a competitor shampoo. All of the, if you look at people that use mask defog, they'll use baby shampoo many times because they don't want it to sting their eyes and it actually works well as a mask defog. All of the ones that I've seen tests on, it's a 100% mortality rate in an aquarium. So we think that it's good for us. It just doesn't cause tears. It doesn't mean that it's good for, for us. So we actually just recently made a mask defog because of it. So that's the feeding behavior. This is where I was talking about settlement. And I think I only have two more slides, so I think we're, we're doing okay. Um, if you put Brand X or you put even some of the other mineral sunscreens that have nanoparticles or things that are not titanium, the one on the right is how fast 
coral has to settle to be viable. So when they breed, right, it's just kind of floating and they come together, the, the egg and sperm, and they have to settle in the correct place to be effective. If they go out to sea, then something else eats them. It's just like a plankton. If they go into shore, it's not viable. If you have settling or things that don't settle, create a suspension in the water, then it causes them to go to shore or out to sea. So we just did a study in Delaware with a gal who was testing horseshoe crabs, which horseshoe crabs, um, I don't know if people know what we use them for. Every medicine that you've ever had injected into you had horseshoe crab blood. Really interesting NPR article. They harvest 30,000 of them a year. They take a third of their blood and throw them back. About 10,000 of them die. If you um, inject the blue blood of a horseshoe crab into a vat of medicine, if it clumps, whatever it clumped on would have killed humans. So they throw it away. If it settles to the bottom, they package it up and ship it. Who knew? It seems like we should have come up with some sort of synthetic way to test it rather than using horseshoe crab blood. But here's the problem. In Delaware, the place where the horseshoe crabs breed is also the place where people swim. That's where all the tourists go. So the amount of suspension of sunscreen chemicals, oils from human bodies, the, you know, lotions, potions, shampoo, whatever, um, cause the horseshoe crab eggs to float in or out rather than settling where they need to. So there's actually documentation of seabirds that have had the same migration for as long as they've been tra you know, tracing seabirds. They now hang a left, go to Delaware, and eat the horseshoe crab eggs off the shore because it's such a big source of protein. But we kind of need those eggs to be viable. So let's get into the nitty gritty about what makes something reef safe or not. We are one of three companies that have passed the Protect Land and Sea certification by Hereticus Labs, and this is on our SPF 30. We're a small company, we haven't sent our shampoo and everything else off for testing yet, but it's all the same ingredients, so we have to assume that it would be pretty, pretty similar. What we found the first time this was available to everybody, my understanding is 105 different brands applied for this certification and everyone failed, including us. For all brands that were labeled reef safe, so you have to understand that there is no designation, there is no certification, there is no group that says this is what reef safe is. It is a bogus term. It is no regulation. Just like saying natural food, like saying baby safe, none of those have any legal definition at all. So we failed, but we were told we were 138 times cleaner than anything else on the planet. Please find out where some of this stuff is leaking in because we actually found all of these things in our products. We traced it all the way back to a place in Snaith, England, which I've never been to Snaith, but it sounds like fog or something Harry Potter would do. Oh, Snaith, that just sounds awful, but I'm sure they're happy there. Uh, they were storing one of our ingredients in a blue plastic tub. That blue plastic tub was actually leaching all of those chemicals into our product very small amounts, but what that says to me is if people have not passed this, they very likely have all of these things in their product or at least some combination of a few. So if you're going to go over the top and be crazy like we are, you go and get this testing and prove that you don't have any of these things in your product, and then you put your product into a sugarcane resin tube instead of plastic. So all of our tubes are based on sugarcane resin. That's kind of scary to me. There's only two other people uh, to date that have passed this test. Um, both of them are zinc based. So we can go back to our discussion on zinc. One of them actually just had test results come through that shows um, that over 20% zinc that's in their product uh, when tested with sea urchin caused deformities and Where do you find us? There we are in the Virgin Islands. And what we want you to know is that a percentage of all of the USVI sales goes to support Island Green. We really want to make sure that we are not just there for profit. 
heck, if we were here for profit, we would be doing chemical sunscreens. They make a lot more money. But we literally can't sleep if we know that we're causing harm. So we want to back the local groups. That's why we're more than happy to do these sort of discussions. Why we want to help out. I actually have reached out to the Montessori schools and we're working with the, the Gift Hill School and things like that. Um, want to provide for them any information they need and give them support as well. So we can use for fundraisers and different things like that. We don't want to be the ones that just come in and, and expect things from you. We want to make sure that we're supporting what you guys have. Going. If somebody on this call is not from the Virgin Islands and can't support one of these local places, you can just go to streamtosee.com and use the Island Green at your checkout, then they will get a percentage of that sale. So we talked about our bioplastic made from sugarcane resin. And we talked about how there's currently no organization or mutually agreed upon term to define reef safe. Stream to sea is the only mineral sunscreen line that has been proven non-toxic to coral larvae, saltwater fish, freshwater fish, and sea elegans. Sea elegans are the little bitty worms that have about 94% of the same DNA as we do. A lot of testing for cancers and things like that actually happens on C. elegans. So read your ingredients, find out what's there. If you can't find us, try to find a mineral only sunscreen. And it should say uh, titanium dioxide or zinc oxide, and it should say non nano. If it doesn't say non nano, it's likely a nano. So those are the, the biggest things to look for. If there's any other active ingredients, don't touch it. You know, if you really want to make sure that you are a, uh, a, a reef protector, but otherwise, go for the best you can. And this is my favorite because I raised Toby cats. I just love this slide. Reminds me of where you guys are, not me. I do have a river, but it doesn't look anything like that. So I am happy. Well, what did I get? 1038 after introduction. That was almost exactly half an hour. Whew. So I am happy to answer questions if anybody has any, and also happy, like I said, to, to do follow-up meetings, do follow-up discussions, talk to schools, whatever people. Mike, we- I have a question. Go ahead. I heard a question. Oh, sure. So I've seen a lot of people wearing Reef Safe sunscreen around here, but it looks like it has, it gives you that zinc, white ghost pasty look. Yep. Um, I think Lydia in our store had a sample where it's tinted beige. Yes. Is, is that all there is or is there one that doesn't give you that zinc well, look? Here's the problem. Yeah, the, the titanium and you do it with a tint, it definitely is better. It definitely blends in better. Um, in Hawaii, I was out surfing because I wouldn't swim in any of the bays because I know the concentration of the chemicals there and I, I can't afford to do that. So I was out surfing and two Hawaiian guys came up to me and they're very protective of their surf breaks for one, but very protective of their reefs for two. They were both, you know, nice tan guys and uh, I am Hawaiian and unfortunately, instead of the cool skin color, I got sturdy bones and wide feet. So I have to wear sunscreen. <laughs> But uh, they had white all over them, and they came over and said, hey, bro, you got to get out of the water. You got the wrong sunscreen on them. Well, this is going to be a good discussion because I had the tint on. So the tint doesn't show up as much. The white, if somebody's rocking the white, thank them, right? Because that means it's not vain. That means they're going for, we're going to do what's best for our bodies, and we're going to do what's best for our environment. It's the old school zinc, you know, where they used to do on the nose, or was a solid white. Yeah, that's the deal is you got to get up to about a 20% zinc, which then unfortunately is a little bit tough on sea urchins and things like that. But um, I prefer the tint, definitely. And a lot of the guys don't like tint because they think it's a makeup. But the deal is wherever you have five o'clock shadow come in and about o'clock for me, um, it, it holds all the white, but the tint doesn't do it. It goes away. It's much smoother. So yeah. The, the one caveat with the tint is if you have a white rash guard or a white bathing suit, it has a tendency to pick up that. 
but almost everything else that I've used, these black polo shirts, it just comes right out. None of it's going to be as beautiful as the lotion that sinks into your skin. <laughs> you want your reproductive system to work, you know? I mean, that's <laughs> Anybody else? Mike, I know we were uh, proud of the fact that the Virgin Islands uh, enacted this legislation, um, being proactive to help uh, protect our coral reefs, uh, and you guys were a big part of that. Can you talk a little bit about uh, other places right now? I know there's some other things that are kind of working through state legislations or they have been passed, but there's a time lag. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what some other states have done, Hawaii, Florida, and that, that kind of thing? Sure. Oh yeah, happily. Um, actually, you guys are only second to Palau for amazing bands. Right, you guys banned the third O, which is really impressive and, and a great idea. Um, and I'll get into that, but I'll tell you, um, Palau has banned all of the things on our ingredients to avoid, essentially. Uh, they've banned 14 different chemicals. If you bring them in, you're subject to a fine. But just like everybody else, it's gonna be hard to enforce. I think it's great that on their airplanes, when you come in, you actually have to sign a pledge and watch a video that says that you're going to take care of their environment. Um, they recently had problems in Palau with um, China and Japan being banned from fishing in some of their waters. And so China and Japan stopped granting visas to go there. So now it's, it's uh, they have about half the tourists that they used to. And so they're trying to make sure that their place stays as pristine as possible and they're gonna go for a different level of tourism. If you look at Hawaii, Hawaii is looking at banning more things. They, their ban just went recently into effect. Um, and actually, I think there's a little bit more time on it before all of it goes into effect. But certain parts of it, they're not allowed to, to restock. They're still allowed to sell what they have, I believe, now. But now they're looking at legislation for 2023 to get closer to a Palau. What you guys effectively did by banning oxybenzone and octanoxate, that's the Hawaii band, um, you added octocrylene. Avobenzone requires octocrylene to work, to keep it safe. And so essentially you banned avobenzone until they come up with another, another chemical to do it. The bummer about avobenzone is it's actually an obesogen also. So it tells your body to retain fat when you put it on you, it actually makes your body retain more fat. And octocrylene is such a aggressive endocrine disruptor that it's been banned in a lot of countries. So good for you guys for keeping it out. Key West, Florida um, banned oxybenzone and octanoxate, but now Florida, uh, the state is trying to ban the bans. They're trying to say that none of the counties or cities or, or any of that can do their own sort of bans. But you know that this is highly political. You know, there's um, Johnson & Johnson is based out of Florida. The owners of it, you know, the original founders of it are based out of Florida. So I'm sure there's a lot of pressure there. Um, a couple of the other Caribbean islands, uh, and there's a lot more that are working. Great, thank but you. Most of them are just oxygen and oxygen oxide. Yeah, most of them are just the two chemicals. So, so you guys are, or ahead of the curve. You're already dealing with the one that just came out to replace those two chemicals. So that's great. In Hawaii, um, and you guys might see it there at some point, um, in Hawaii, if they're still allowed to sell off their stock on the back of the bottle where it says ingredients, that's where they're putting the price tag. So that you can't tell what the ingredients are without peeling the price tag off. Trying to sell their back stock. Yeah, yeah. Horrendous. Any other questions for Mike? Yeah. I have another question. So why would you say they want to ban the ban? Is it expensive to make? What, the sunscreen or the ban? The reef safe sunscreen? Um, yeah, it is expensive to make. It, I don't think it has to do with that at all. Um, uh, one of the biggest people that are against bans are actually dermatologists. And their argument makes no sense unless you follow the money, right? right? So if you 
look at it and say, if something says SPF 30, that means it's an SPF 30 according to the FDA. It doesn't matter whether it's chemical or mineral, whatever. If it says SPF 30, it is blocking the sun the same as something else that says SPF 30, right? In theory. Um, so it doesn't hold any water, but there's a lot of groups that are really against that. And yes, using titanium dioxide is the most expensive option that you can come up with. Adding all of the antioxidants that we do is the most expensive option you can come up with. Adding um, sugarcane resin tubes to make sure that there's no toxins in it, it just sends it through the roof. So yeah, it is significantly more expensive to produce. The interesting part is, well, if you really compared us to other products, we should be at about a $40 price point, right? And we're at a $17 price point. So um, if you really compare apples to apples, uh, as far as how far things will go in cost, you use very little of the mineral sunscreen in comparison to the chemical. You, it spreads differently. It stays on top. It doesn't need to spread in. It lasts longer. And then it's got that three-year shelf life. So really, I was doing a podcast in Key West, and the gal that was hosting the podcast did a quick little calculation and said, wait a minute. Um, I can keep my reproductive system working for about a dollar more, you know, and that was really her rationale. It was like, oh, come on, you know, a $4 tube of something that's super toxic or a $17 tube that goes four times as long, you're pretty darn close to the same thing, you know. So it does cost manufacturers more, but understand that my profit margins are much smaller than the chemical. Even at $4, their profit margins are two to three times our profit. So yeah, they would rather just stick with what they have because they're making nice. it. Nice. Somebody will buy it. Yeah. It's too bad. <laughs> yeah, billions of dollars. Yeah. Thanks. Tell us of that part, but that's it. <laughs> Any other questions for Mike? We're going to have to end fairly soon. We have a one o'clock session coming up that we have to prepare for. But Mike, I wanted to thank you for taking the time to to educate us and inform us on this. And I want, really do want to uh, thank stream to see for all the support that you've given. Um, this isn't the first time Mike's uh, participated in something with us and we're, we're really appreciative of the, the support that you give down here. And so I look forward to seeing you next time you visit. Yeah, for sure. Well, my, uh, my whole goal is to save all the babies, right? So I don't yeah. care if they're coral or if they're human. And Autumn will talk more about reef and I talk more about the endocrine system because my thyroid stopped working. I'd like to not have anybody else experience that, right? Yeah. So, so to me, anybody that wants to help me save the babies, let's talk about it. All right, great. Well, thanks everyone for joining Thank us. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, and we'll see you soon. Yeah. Thank you. All right, bye everyone. <laughs>